Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Betting Life Show brought to you by Fantasy Life. I'm Matthew Friedman, Matt F. The Oracle. March Madness has finally arrived, and here with me to break down the men's tournament is a new contributor at Betting Life, Cody Malstrom, who specializes in college sports. Cody, how's it going? Oh, it's going great. Uh, I mean, one of the best uh, sporting times of the year have finally arrived. I, I, I just can't be any more excited. It's just as soon as that bracket comes out, just the whole mood changes. And now we're just on the countdown to uh, to uh, Thursday. Well, I, I mean, I guess I'll recognize the first four, but kind of old school at heart. I wish we'd go back to 64. Yes, the obligatory first four. So we're recording this on Monday afternoon. Uh, so the first four games start tomorrow. Cody, you, uh, I believe, already have a piece that has been submitted to Fantasy Life, uh, looking at some of the kind of preliminary best bets uh, based on how everything stands now with the bracket. Um, and you know, most people probably know that I don't follow college basketball until this time of the year, but March Madness player props are actually the thing that maybe I consistently have done the best since I started betting, uh, as weird as that sounds. So I do player projections for every tournament game. Those projections will be available on the site. I've already done the projections for the first four games and uh, now just starting to crank away on day one of round one. So uh, everyone be sure to check out the player projections for March Madness live on the site for free. And then also in the free picks channel of the Fantasy Life Discord, I will post all of the player prop bets that I like. Be sure to join that. And then each day I will post my favorite bets in the Fantasy Life bet tracker. So all of that player prop goodness that people can catch. But uh, of course, player props, uh, softer markets, definitely not the same can be said for those harder markets of sides and totals for March Madness and Cody. That is why you are here to help us wade through all of that. So excited to have this conversation with you before we get to, I'd say like the betting implications of everything. Of course, people just regardless of betting, like watching the tournament, they get obsessed with the brackets, with the, the pools that they get into. So let's kind of start there and start with selection Sunday. Did anything surprise you in terms of teams that got into the tournament or some teams that were left out of it? Yeah. Let, let's start with the, uh, the big one for left out. Uh, I, I, I don't understand the committee. I, I, I don't know what their processes are anymore. I mean, you make these net rankings, NET rankings, and then if we go off of that, this one just doesn't make sense. How they left out St. John's blows my mind. This team, if you look at Ken Palm, they finished 25th highest rated team that was left out um, that didn't get an automatic qualifying bid. And then you put in someone like Virginia, and if we're using Ken Palm again, you scroll down, they're all the way down to 69th, lower net ranking, lower net ranking than some other teams that were like still left out, Oklahoma, Seton Hall. I don't know if the committee has something against the Big East. Um, I was very, very shocked to see that. The St. John's, yes, they were on the bubble. You can make an argument if they really wanted to secure the spot, they should have beat UConn, and they, and they didn't in the Big East uh, tournament. But how they still got left out, and then just kind of a slap in the face of putting Virginia in, just a team that I think universally no one wants to see. Uh, that's and, and, then, and then another one I want to bring in. Michigan State. So this is where I kind of get confused. Michigan State had a very underwhelming res terms of results if, when you look at their record. Now Ken Palm and uh, Torvik, they still like them in terms of like like advanced stats. Like they just underperformed, I guess, per their record, in, in which that can tend to happen. A team can be very very unlucky throughout the year. Luck plays a major factor in a season long performance, and they did fin for Ken Palm. They finished three hundred and fifty fifth in luck. But like I said, the advanced stats still like, still like them. So I'm kind of torn there. Like, yes, I'm excited that we can have a team that can compete in the tournament. But when you terms when you use the term the teams that best fit in or deserve to be in, I, I still just don't understand how they get in over a St. John's. All right. And then in terms of the seeding, anything stand out to you as a surprise in terms of like how the regions were brought together or, you know, this team is a, a one seed, but really is more like a three seed in terms of its quality. Anything like that stand out in the seeding? Yeah, let's keep the theme on the, the committee screw in the Big East. Uh, in my understanding, when you are the number one overall team, you deserve the easiest path to the final four. That's not the case this year for, for UConn. Holy cow, what a absolute shock of a reveal from the start. Uh, they are the number one team, and their reward, they get Iowa State, Auburn, and BYU, and Illinois. 
all in the regions two through five. You're going to hear me reference uh, Ken Palm, his, Ken Palm national title contender per historic metrics a lot uh, throughout this podcast. And what that basically is, is just a way to kind of filter out what teams have fit the mold of a champion um, heading into March Madness. And you, UConn fits that. Uh, oh, and I guess I'll explain it too. Um, what that is for, there's a lot of various ways you can do it the way I do it. It's top 25 adjusted offensive efficiency. And then when you combine their defensive efficiency, they combine for less than 50 overall. Uh, going For UConn's uh, region alone, UConn, Iowa State, and Auburn all go into March Madness fitting that. BYU and Illinois, they fit it through a good chunk of the year throughout the middle of the season. And then they're de- because of their defense regressing, they fell out of the uh, qualifiers. And then also Auburn, Iowa State, and Illinois, all riding momentum, all conference championship winners, all in one region, in UConn's region. I just don't know how you do that to uh, the number one overall team. Auburn alone, I kind of thought was kind of a shock at four and then also getting in UConn. So like when, like you said, I, I had a piece previously um, released for uh, betting life. Auburn was a future I was looking at. And then as soon as I saw there and potentially mean UConn, the sweet 16, I was like, well, all right, time to look elsewhere. <laughs> that, that kind of ruined that dream there. Uh, so yeah, that was definitely the big surprise, I guess, in terms of seeding. And then also another team I was looking at, New Mexico as an 11 seed is just absurd to me. Uh, we're going to be talking about them a lot. Um, I guess in a way I'm kind of thankful they because they're kind of fitting the mold of a double-digit seed who can make a run. That's just an 11 seed no one wants to uh, face. And, yeah, I, I thought that was kind of a shock, especially where they got seeded lower than some other teams like an FAU. It's just, it's just a, I don't know. This, this seeding just did not make sense this year. Is there anything in terms of uh, injuries, player injuries, that you think could have a big impact on the tournament? Yeah, so we'll start with the big one, uh, Kansas. So I, as a better, and honestly, as you're just making your pool, I, I I personally like to stay away from uncertainty as much as possible. In Kansas, I mean, they have injuries to Kevin McCuller and Hunter Dickinson, two of their best players. It was very obvious in the Big 12 tournament. Every interview Bill Seth was doing, he was just like, we just want to get healthy. Like, that's the name of the game. And we saw with when Cincinnati opens a fa- or closes a favorite against them. So it's like, yeah, you, you got a week of rest, but are they still even coming back 100%? Now you're factoring in rust. So they're definitely someone you want to watch, right? Or you want to monitor in their first game. You want to see how they look. Because if they're healthy, I mean, this was also a team who fit as a Ken Palm star champion throughout a majority of the year before they fell out due to injuries. Um, Northwestern's Matthew Nicholson. He's a, he's a pretty big one in terms of their matchup against FAU. Uh, he's their big man center. He's really the only guy who could guard uh, Vlad. If he's out, the FAU is going to have a massive advantage on the inside and it's going to open up more consistent scoring. So that's kind of more of around one matchup here. Purdue's Braden Smith. He seems to be all right. I, I it looked like the media kind of over blew that one uh, if he but, but if he's not 100 percent, they're very very thin at uh guard production missing his production would be huge especially if he got re-injured again um and marquette's tyler kolik the night and day without him he's an absolute stud at guard and marquette's production heavily relies on their guard play um creating space and just destroying teams through the mid-range if he's gone it doesn't really necessarily make him one-dimensional because they do have other productive players but without him it's a lot easier to guard marquette and that could really hamper their uh, ability to make a run all right so i mentioned it earlier this is uh you know the time of year when people get really like for this short period of time like three four day stretch get really into their brackets super obsessed with brackets doing as much research as they can and you know by the way friend of the show the power rank ed fang uh, at his site, does some really great bracket analysis. Do you have thoughts on some of the optimal ways to approach brackets? I would say kind of like in general, and then also particularly for this year and given what we see. Yeah, um, I, I hate I, it's, it's, I hate saying it this way, but you really got to limit the amount of upsets you pick. That's how you get burned um, in your bracket pools, uh, specifically talking about making uh, uh, brackets and you want to uh, win your pools. Um, you got to factor in your group size and point scale. I think those are two things that largely get overlooked. I think because the, 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 the normal person just they treat the same pool the same way, like no matter what it is, whether it's a small company one or a huge nationwide one uh, like uh, ESPN dolls out. You really, you really got to focus in on it because a lot of the times the ones who win are the teams who either pick the champion 
or had like one or two final four picks, decent amount of lead eight. Because when you look at the average scoring, it's very heavily tailored towards uh, monster size points at the very end of the uh, the very end of the tournament. So when you're picking these upsets, you're you're kind of taking you're taking away middle points, and you'll see t- people have like teams go all the way to the lead eight. It's just really not the case. I mean, I, I pulled up a um, so, some historic part here. At least one double digit seed has made it to the Sweet 16, and every single year, only on average, a little over two teams make it per year. So when you're going upset heavy, you're just taking away more points than what you really should just be doing by just kind of going chalk here. All right, so I think that's good advice and uh, consistent with other uh, other things I've I've heard from from people. But uh, okay, high seeded teams that you think have a pretty good chance of making the final four. Who are those? All right. So we'll go region by region here. Um, I like to pick out a few teams. Um, I do multiple brackets. I like to make some combinations. We'll start with the East, the loaded one. We already previously mentioned until proven. Otherwise UConn's the team to beat. Uh, We haven't seen a repeat champion since Florida. Um, I think this team has honestly as good as chance in any. They're super deep. They excel at every single area of the court. But a team they're going to face in the Sweet 16 is Auburn, and that's going to be my second team, uh, mainly because I won. All these things I'm going to mention fit the Ken Palm Historic National Champion mold. And two, I want to fade in Iowa State. Um, it's going to be hypocritical when we talk about the next region, but it's not more so about their metrics. It's their style of play. When it comes to a single elimination format um, uh, as a March Madness, I want to avoid teams who are very slow-paced, bask a lot of their success solely on defense, and, and but because of their pace, they're limiting their amount of offensive possessions. We've seen time and time again, it, all it takes is one team to get really hot one night. And if you can't stop them and they're hitting threes in your face, like they're, they're just on fire, you'll get bounced. Um, and then Iowa state at that two seed, I mean, they fits that mold, uh, Illinois, their defense is mightily regressed. BYU, they're, they're an intriguing team, but if they go against an Auburn or UConn, they're going to really struggle with their size. So to me in that region, if that comes down to that sweet 16 matchup, I believe the winner of that's going to move on. Uh, we'll go to the West. <laughs> I, I, I could not be happier as a Tar Heel fan, the way this bracket has shaped out. I think we are on a crash course for what the media is going to love, a Caleb Love at Arizona reunion against North Carolina Elite Eight. So uh, North Carolina and Arizona are my two picks for who I think will be in the Final Four. Uh, Chalk heavy on that one. Uh, Baylor's a three seed. They just have such a tough time with their interior defense. And when you kind of get to March Madness, it's an emphasis of interior scoring because, I mean, shooting doesn't necessarily always translate with travel, but interior scoring, rebounding, free throw shooting all does. To, to me, Baylor, I think their defense is going to be their own undoing. Um, and then when I made a joke about how I'm going to be a hypocrite, because I was talking about I hate the style of play in the tournament format, the South region, I love Houston. Uh, Houston, large part, all of the season, was number, Ken Palm's number one team until UConn jumped him at the very end. I just hate that style of play that when they limit their own number of possessions. But the difference this year, a lot more offensive firepower. Um it's going to create more consistent scoring opportunities, but this defense is also on a whole nother world. I think to, to make me my own words, that style of play with this Houston talent will be the team to make a run. And then also this team doesn't fit the Ken Palm um, contender uh, metrics, but Kentucky super intriguing team this year, a team that has battled health all year. It's just the defense is horrifically bad. And allegedly, when Big Z was coming back from injury, it was going to get a lot better. It's just he has had been very minimal production. But also at the same time, the Big 12 tournament, we've seen them when they played, or not Big 12 tournament, when their season finale, when they played defense, this team looked like every bit of a champion. They were awesome to watch. The offense is unmatched. It's just they have very young guards, which can be prone to more turnovers, kind of folding under pressure. And like I said, the defense, I don't know if, Coach, uh, I don't know if Cal's not teaching them how to guard a ball screen or what's going on because teams are having high quality shots at the rim at a routine rate. But if this team's defense shows up like we have seen at Spurts, they can make a run and they definitely have the offense to bust a stout Houston defense. And then we'll move to the Midwest, just kind of a meh region. When we talk about really easy paths, they really gave Purdue a nice, easy one. And the two teams I'm going to mention Purdue and Tennessee. Or another metric or another factor that I haven't even mentioned yet, coaching plays a big part. And of course, Purdue and Tennessee, they kind of have two coaches who uh, have lately kind of 
underwhelmed <laughs> in tournament with Rick Barnes and Matt Painter. But when I just look at this region, I don't see who contends with them. So I'm going chalk heavy there for uh, these lower seeds I think are going to make a run. All right. And then the teams that are further down the board in the brackets, you mentioned earlier, uh, we've had at least one double digit seed make the Sweet 16 every year for like the past like 15 since years 2007. or so. Yeah, since yep. 2007. Uh, you mentioned New Mexico and how it's absurd that New Mexico is a uh, number 11 seed. Uh, um, so I'm assuming you probably like New Mexico to be a team that has a chance of advancing into the Sweet 16. But what are your thoughts on some of those teams that are lower in brackets that actually might have a chance of kind of going further than people think? Yeah, so I narrowed my focus on just two teams this year. I do have a third one in mind. Um, I want to look deeper into them. Um, I'll just mention that team real quick. It's Drake. Uh, very, they're kind of a public darling here. A lot of people are believing they can make a run. I just need to personally look more into them. But two teams I've zeroed in on, like we mentioned, New Mexico. This team is just incredible. Uh, highest seeded team, or highest double digit seeded team in Kempom. They finished the year 23rd. <laughs> they've proven they can play with the big boys and their bracket layout. I mean, they get a regressing Clemson team who has just fallen off a cliff on the defensive end. And then, like I mentioned, and then if they assume they'll probably get a date with Baylor, New Mexico, their offense thrives on slashing and getting to the rim. That's Baylor's defensive bugaboo. Baylor is going to have to try and uh, match their scoring pace with jump shooting. And if you're giving me a team who is going to have higher quality looks at the rim versus a team who relies more on jump shooting, I'm going to take the New Mexico 10 times out of 10 with that one. I hope we get that matchup. I think that'd be super exciting to watch. And then the other double digit seeded team I'm looking at, uh, McNeese State. I'm not, I was mixed feelings with their first round matchup. They get, they have Gonzaga and McNeese thrives at perimeter production. Now, I hate kind of backing teams who rely heavily on the three. But Gonzaga's just been that awful at guarding it. Gonzaga's going to want to play fast. It's I think if they could just get past Gonzaga, I really like their chances of making the Sweet 16 because I'm assuming we're probably going to get a hobbled Kansas squad. And like I mentioned at the start, until further notes, I'm just going to assume Dickinson and McCullough is not going to be 100%. And we've seen this team mightily uh, regress without their production. I just think a fast-paced scoring um, team against McNeese, it, it can, if they get a Kansas in their next round and they can't really keep up, I think that's a live Sweet 16 team. I am. Um, I, I guess spoiler alert: I do have bets on both these teams to make the Sweet 16 and uh, some juicy odds. Two, of, two of my favorite bets. All right. So I mean, looking right now in round one, uh, day one of round one, McNeese playing Gonzaga, I believe a six and a half point underdog. So like, not out of the realm of possibility for them to to win that game. Um, you can definitely see how it happens. All right. So you mentioned there. You know, bets on New Mexico, bets on McNeese State to uh, to make the Sweet 16. Uh, I'm assuming that there are other future bets that you do like. Uh, let's start to to talk about those, and let's just say like start to win the tournament. Mm -hmm. If you know, and I know in a lot of future markets there aren't there aren't valuable bets. You know, like there's just a lot of juice that is built into this market, so I think it's harder to find bets that you could see is representing value, but are there any bets to win the tournament that you think do represent value right now? Yeah. I think when it comes to college basketball, um, you kind of hit the nail on the head there. It, a lot of the betting kind of comes throughout adding teams throughout the season as we go. Cause when we get to the start of March madness, a lot of that value has kind of um, disappeared, but two teams that immediately stood out to me uh, once we got the bracket reveal, North Carolina and Arizona. I truly think, these are the two teams in this region. You can get North Carolina, best um, current odds, um, 1,800. That was at FanDuel in Arizona, plus 1,600 at Bet Rivers, 18 to 1, 16 to 1. I could get a crash course with those in the Elite Eight, and I could get a decent sized ticket in the Final Four. I, I I love it. I absolutely love it. I like, I'm not sold on Baylor. I just, and their defense, I think it's, it's going to be their own undoing. Everyone else in the region is underwhelmed. And I'll start with North Carolina absolutely super favorable favorable path to the elite eight uh they'll get mississippi state or michigan state um in the next round mississippi state's defense is just not sound they're, 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 their offense isn't gonna be able to kind of compete with the consistency north carolina brings and michigan state on, like i said advanced metric wise they are a dangerous team then you have the whole Izzo thing and you know for every march it kind of gets a little overplayed um 
I just, but the Michigan State's bigger issue in a specific matchup against North Carolina if they move on, they do not have the bigs to uh, contain Harrison Ingram and Armando Baycott. And Michigan State just won't have the offensive consistency to kind of really battle with it. I think that's a super favorable matchup for North Carolina. And then if, I, if I'm just going chalk heavy, they'll have a date with Alabama. Alabama's defense is so horrific. And public advice, avoid a team like Alabama to the, to the public. That might be like a big team to kind of back. No, this this their, their, their offense alone, it's not enough in a tournament format to get them past. And honestly, a little maybe upset alert in the first round. I, I haven't fired on yet. But when I talk about uh, their best bet later, you'll, you'll, you'll kind of get a feeling why. And then Arizona, same exact kind of reasoning. They have a very favorable path. I just want to get one of the big tickets into the Final Four, and it's kind of going to present some hedge options or maybe a free roll and then hedge in the national championship if they win their Final Four. All right, so that's to win the tournament. What about the various stages? You mentioned uh, McNeese, New Mexico earlier to win the Sweet 16. What else stands out to you with the Sweet 16? Yeah, I thought Creighton was very underpriced. They're kind of an intriguing team. So they fit the Ken Palm national title mold um, to, to win it all. I kind of temper that because, like I mentioned earlier, I'm not a big fan of teams who rely heavily on uh, jump shots. But I was just really surprised to see how low they were juiced. It was minus 155. I think it's like all the way up to minus 205 now. So kind of the value zapped out of that one as we're talking. But they got Akron in the first round, and then they get the winner of South Carolina and Oregon. Very low on South Carolina. Uh, this team, per luck rankings, has run very lucky. It does not match their advanced stats. They are due for some hardcore regression in, uh, in this tournament. And then Oregon kind of squeaked by. They don't seem like too big of a threat to me um, against Crane's offense. And then one more. Um, I have Duke to make the Sweet 16. I just realized all my bets are all Sweet 16. Uh, they, were, they were minus 120 on Fandle. They've already kind of hit a bump. Vermont dangerous team but their history they've only won one tournament game and then also it was just a really bad draw for vermont um oh and that was another injury i forgot to mention uh they're big who would be the guy to guard filipowski he's dealing with an injury it sounds like he's coming back but not going to be a hundred percent that's going to be an absolute nightmare because filipowski has really transformed into just a star at scoring he can take you at the perimeter he can take you on the post he can beat you one-on-one -on -one. if he gets going it's just going to command defensive attention from elsewhere good facilitating team it's going to open up high quality opportunities all around the court i think duke's kind of going to pace vermont in that one and then their next matchup would be wisconsin or jmu that's where it kind of gets dicey i'm really rooting for a jmu upset in that one um wisconsin would be a far more dangerous team they're more well-rounded but i think duke could still contend uh, duke would be the favorite in that one it, uh, that's a little more intriguing but I, I, oh geez i figured that one was just going to get pounded so i wanted to grab a, a quick duke one on that one and like so i'm gonna be praying for G G G jmu all right so those are the futures We've got the first four and you mentioned your uh, more of a purist and I'll say I, I don't understand why we have a first four, but whatever we we have the first four games two on Tuesday, two on Wednesday. And uh, those games are let me see here. Wagner, Howard, Howard favored by three and a half Colorado State, Virginia, CSU favored by two and a half. And then on Wednesday, Grambling, Montana State, Montana State favored by three and a half. And then Colorado, Boise State, Colorado favored by two, two and a half. Anything out of those four games stand out to you? So, yeah, not only am I not a fan of the first four, we we, we don't have enough time in the day to even talk about how we're, now we're thinking about even more expansion. <laughs> we'll save that for a different day. But this first four, especially, just absolutely zero intrigue. And blame Virginia. It's just It's so deflating that they're in here. I am. This not a bet, yes, but speaking of Virginia, I am looking at the under on that game. It, the over got hit right away, so I kind of want to see how high that can climb. Colorado State will have no issue playing with Virginia style of play. It's going to be a super slow, very low uh, amount of offensive possessions for both teams. Both teams excel at kind of smothering um, the quality of shots. Uh, that that'll be an ugly one. But like I said, the over got hit right away. I want to see how high it'll climb before taking an under. One play I do have. Um, I grabbed Colorado minus two. I believe it's up to three in some shops now. I like it anything uh, lower than four. Talk about another criminally underrated team. Uh, like St. John's, Colorado was also highly. Oh, it actually won under St. John's per Kempon. They finished 26, second highest double digit seed under New Mexico. This Colorado team, very well rounded, very, very dangerous um, team. 
they they have uh Eddie they brought in Eddie Lampkin from TCU. Um, I know you're <laughs> well aware that your TCU Horn Frogs um, absolutely transformed their interior. Uh, he Boise State's are kind of I don't want to call them one dimensional because they are capable of hitting the three, but a lot of their production revolves around getting to the rim. Eddie Lampkin, as long as he stays out of foul trouble, he can just smother every shot down there. It's going to really drastically slow down Boise State's scoring. Colorado uh, with uh, KJ Simpson, huge perimeter threat. It's going to really space out Boise State. It's just going to create more opportunities whether they want to slash, uh, Duncan in, or hit the three if, if they could stay hot shooting. I just personally don't see how Boise State with kind of their one major source of scoring production kind of getting limited here. I just don't see how they're going to stay within scoring pace. Uh, Colorado, the only thing that sucks, I want to say Colorado is just that team that in the first four can make kind of a mini run. But their next matchup against Florida is a huge problem for them. So, but just sticking with the first four, I do like them to cover the spread and move on. All right. And then round one, uh, you know, you've mentioned at this point a number of teams that you maybe like for futures or you think they're underrated. I imagine some of those teams might be ones you're looking at for round one. But what stands out to you uh, in the round one matchups, uh, you know, both from just like a basketball perspective? but then also a betting perspective. Yeah, so actually funny you mentioned that. As much as I love um, North Carolina to to make a run here, it's also a team I want to avoid betting, Um, mainly because they're going to be a monster-sized favorite in their first-round matchup. But, I mean, it's not all uh, perfection over here uh, for the Tar Heels because they have one huge um, negative factor going for them that does give me a scare. So you may see, if you use uh, Ken Palm, you'll see that North Carolina, they finished the year six in total adjusted uh, defensive efficiency. And you might be, wow, this team's like super amazing at defense. That's not entirely the case. Yes, they excel um, with their interior production, but per shot quality, they are so bad at allowing teams high quality three-point opportunities. Just the strange thing is these teams just don't make their shots and it's regressions coming. And that kind of does scare me in a betting perspective. The back door will always be wide open. I just need a team to get hot for a brief second and it gets a little scary. Um, their offense. Yes. Uh, RJ Davis is an absolute star. Uh, he can slash, he can shoot. Armando Baycott is a force down low, but Harrison Ingram, he, he he's capable of stretching the floor. Elliot Cadeau has kind of turned into a true point. They could kind of run cold if RG Davis or Baycott, if Baycott's not getting uh, good looks or Davis kind of runs cold. They are prone to lulls. So factor in that with their inability to cover the perimeter um, or at least the quality of shots from the perimeter, it, it, gets, it, it gets dicey. So I want to avoid them in a betting perspective. Now, for the first round, I do have some bets that I fired on right away. Um, I brought up Alabama earlier. I This was like in my notes over no matter what. Now, joking, obviously, the number plays a major factor. Um, I grabbed over 169 right away. I believe it already shot up to 173. It's still a playable range for me because um, it's. I think this is going to be one of the more low-key exciting games. Charleston, their opponent, we can make a joke. It's Alabama light, <laughs> just a smaller school, Alabama. The offensive identities are nearly identical. Both teams want to get out as fast as possible since so they haul in a rebound. Super perimeter heavy. Charleston finished the year top three and three point rate. Alabama top 20. Both excel and both don't play defense. Um, and more important, especially when you're kind of backing it over with a smaller school involved, Alabama's interior defense is horrific. They just do not guard the rim. So if Charleston's jump shots aren't going down from the perimeter, they should have no issue with slashing, uh, getting to it, which is going to just create more scoring consistency. And Alabama will obviously have no issue implementing their offense. The only thing that could burn this over is both teams going cold. And for just how well they have run um, their offensive identities, I just don't see it happening. I think it's going to be one of the most exciting uh, scoring contests in round one. And I believe... Don't quote me on that. I believe this is already the highest total in March Madness history. I'm not 100% sure on that one. I think I saw that. And and honestly, I think this number is just going to continue to balloon up. Yeah, I was going to say, um, you know, a big part for me of doing the player projections is anchoring on um, the implied totals that each team is going to have based on the spread and the total that uh, is in the market, especially at the Sharper Books. When I was looking at this game, it was uh, it had already moved up from 169, uh, 169 and a half to 171 and a half. Now at circa, it's at 173 and a half. Wow. 
it's 174 at DraftKings. It might continue to move, but uh, I mean, I don't have a a like sort of historical sense of you know week to week, year to year, where these numbers generally are. But I just know you know based on doing projections that you know a number in the 150s tends to be like a respectable total. You know, it's not like amazingly high, but like you know that's starting to get a little bit on the higher side. You don't see stuff in the 160s all that often. Uh, so, for instance, outside of this other game that we're talking about, I think we have maybe only a couple of games uh, in round one that are in the 160s. For something to be like in the 170s, like that is just like astronomical. Uh, and I mean, just even thinking from the player prop perspective, all of these guys are just going to have massive numbers uh in, in the projections that i'm imagining and what we're going to see in the markets like 173 and a half is just so unbelievably high yeah and and, uh, and well worth it uh, this like i said charleston I, I joke it it's an alabama light um what's the uh what's the phrase all gas no breaks that's that's what we're gonna see the whole entire game um like i said both teams as soon as they haul in a rebound it's get out and go you're really taking advantage of a scrambling uh, transition defense and you're and, and both teams knocked the three down at a super high rate and well-deserved. I mean, they proved it throughout the whole course of a season. I, th I think we're due for a very fun one. I, yeah, like so that, And then with the big thing for me, like I mentioned earlier, it's just the interior defense when you're running cold. I mean, you got to attack the basket and kind of get back into your rhythm. Both teams just are not a threat whatsoever at guarding the rim, which to me, when you're going for the high total, you need the lower seat, the Charleston, the lesser team, I guess is what you'd say to uh, to keep up with the scoring pace. And they have every bit of the offensive firepower to do so and a weak Alabama to take advantage of to, uh, to do it. All right. Well, OK, that one's going to be interesting. And I'll just say uh, I don't even during March Madness, I don't watch every basketball game. It's just like not the way in which I'm going to uh, to dedicate my time uh, in part because I have to do player projections and there's not enough time for me to do projections and to be watching games really intently. But uh, this game, Alabama Charleston, that might be one where I'm actually just putting the computer down and actually just watching that game because, uh, I mean, that could be an exciting game in general, even if I'm not betting on it, but maybe there still is some value there uh, on the, the over. Okay, other games that have your eye in terms of a betting opportunity for round one. Yeah, uh, before we go to the next game, that, that's a key thing I wanted to mention. I, I don't know if – I don't believe I mentioned it earlier – um, just, just because I fired on early bracket one, and this is just general betting advice for anyone. Um, sometimes it's also worth just being patient. Um, you'll see these people hammer these lines right away. And like I say, especially these underdogs, it's huge public darlings. Like, I mean, people love seeing the underdogs. Sometimes if you just stay patient and you kind of lead up to the game, it'll create value on the favorites. Um, so, but I, I, now, as I said, I have nothing we're monitoring right now until we get closer to, to game time. But yeah, that was just something I also wanted to say, because like you said, when we mentioned uh, the steam, how like this totals already been seen up a few numbers, if it keeps getting astronomically high, I mean, at some point there's going to be value towards the under. Um, so that's just always uh, something worth monitoring. Uh, but now going to the next game, we mentioned this team multiple times. Man, I really hope they don't make me look dumb, but it's New Mexico. Um, I got a minus two against Clemson believe they shot up to three three and a half um there's just not only is this a dangerous team um one of the more dangerous double digit teams i can think of in a while but they're just getting clemson at just the perfect time uh clemson was once a team that was kind of flirting with ken palm national title metrics and then this they've just run so cold but not even more so not even the emphasis cold on their offense it's the defense has become really alarming I just remember they maybe they remember they're in the ACC and defense has been kind of optional lately, but they're just they get the perfect opportunity for their first round game. New Mexico absolutely thrives uh, with slashing interior scoring. That's a huge thing I look for in tournament style of play. It's just I like teams with who present more consistent scoring potential. Uh, like I said, I want to avoid jump shooting teams. New Mexico, they have three absolute studs who just thrive at just crashing the interior. And even with that, a good facility team. And they're, all, and they're a capable three-point shooting team. So if Clemson, whose defense has just been awful lately, if they kind of really got to suck it into the interior, they're just it's going to create more high-quality perimeter production. I just think New Mexico is just so built with their versatility um, of their uh, guards. I just don't see how Clemson's going to be able to stop them. Even It's going to be incredible. And then Clemson on offense, 
they kind of really rely on their interior with PJ Hall. New Mexico has trees down there as well, and they do a very good job of kind of shifting over. They're going to just get the ball out of his hands. It's going to turn Clemson into a jump shooting team, which is just to create less consistency. I just think New Mexico, they're just going to punch him in the mouth from the start. And now we're talking about Clemson, who also, I haven't even mentioned this yet, they fit the mold of what I hate, uh, the very slow tempo team who limits their own number of possessions, and they're just prone to getting beat by a team who can either get hot or they can thrive at um, consistent scoring in the interior. If New Mexico gets out from the jump, Clemson's not built to uh, come out of a deficit. And I truly think that's what we're going to see here for just how sluggish this team has looked. I absolutely love New Mexico. Um, anything less than four, I, I, th- I think this team's built for a run here. Yeah, I mean that's great. Looking at uh, the unabated line uh, here, you know, from our friends at Unabated, uh, this is minus two. Uh, it's minus two at Circa, and it's actually at FanDuel minus one and a half uh, wow. with minus one of five odds. So I think that's a pretty good opportunity. Like we have a a low hold market going on right now for this game. So uh, that might be something I attack there. Uh, when we we're talking before we started recording, uh, I mentioned TCU over the the right shoulder here. I've got the little bobblehead horn frog from uh, my days there in Fort Worth. Uh, TCU, I see uh, looking at the show sheet, is one of your favorite bets for round one. Yeah, this team is awesome. Um... But TCU, you know, they broke my heart last year with what happened right before March Madness. But then they made up for it with that uh, that covering last second shot against Gonzaga. But yeah, nope, we're we're going back into the wall. I love TCU again this year, um, or in, the, in their first round matchup, I should say. Oh, wow, this this defense is super physical. It's uh, they're going to turn their defense into offense here. Uh, havoc, havoc style of play. That's that's the word I want to use. Which havoc style of play to me that means generating turnovers, kind of a really in your face kind of defense, uh, force the other team to make mistakes, and that's just going to generate more scoring consistency. And Utah State's defense has absolutely fallen off a cliff at um, kind of shot coverage, which that has been kind of an inconsistent area for TCU um, at times throughout the season. And I just think TCU is getting undervalued here. I just it doesn't make sense to me because um, the Big Twelve, um, the, the best conference in basketball, the toughest conference in basketball, TCU has some very impressive wins throughout the year. And now you're kind of telling me where they're about the same as Utah State. It just makes absolutely no sense to me. Uh, Utah State's young guards are gonna. It's gonna be an absolute struggle against this kind of style of play. I'm just expecting kind of an uptick in turnovers on that end. TCU is just kind of going to set the scoring pace way too fast for Utah State to keep up with off the backs of their defense. They're just going to really abuse the interior. I, I I love TCU here. The price or the the spread just made no sense to me, and just kind of like a matchup on paper perspective. When you just look at kind of their uh, their portfolio as a whole. All right, so TCU minus three at a lot of books. It has moved to three and a half at DraftKings and MGM. Uh, you know, maybe we'll continue to move that way. Uh, so, you know, maybe better to grab it now. Uh, and then one more bet I see that you like here, Kentucky minus 12 and a half. I, I know like some people don't mind, you know, laying because that's not like a massive number. It's not like they're favored by 20, but like, you know, they're double digit favorites in round one. Some people are a little uncertain about, you know, how to approach bigger favorites, especially early in the tournament. What is it that you like about Kentucky in this spot? Matchup perspective. So the Oakland's defense, it's very zone heavy. And to be the zone, you require uh, facilitation and the, the ability to knock down shots which you know, I've said multiple times, I don't like teams that pass their ability on shot making, but Kentucky's offense, it's just a whole nother realm. They, they definitely have the offense to consistently bust this zone as the, the shots are going in. And then they also just have a far superior team on the interior, athletic, speed wise, size wise. Um, they, 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 yes, obviously against the zone, it's not the most ideal to kind of rely on your interior scoring because you just shade over. But I mean, if, if we're stretching out the zone right away with elite per uh, friend or shot making and just driving through, um, uh, kind of shifting to the way they want to make for more open shots, I, I, Kentucky to me just has the absolute opportunity to do it. And Oakland's offense to me, so. But you're also when you're back in Kentucky, you gotta back this defense. And like I said, throughout a majority of the year, non-existent. Around the end of the year, as they kind of started getting healthy, as they kind of started just getting better as as it went throughout their competition, the, when the Kentucky plays defense, it's one of the best teams in basketball. 
I hate saying that because I hate Kentucky, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, but against Oakland's Oakland's offense to me, they, they just don't possess enough uh, production kind of consistently break the, uh, break their defense. And I think it's kind of just going to allow, it's going to give Kentucky the opportunity to kind of uh, stay lax uh, more. So it's going to help them be, it's going to give them more time to kind of shift over. They're, they're not going against a Tennessee or an Alabama, like uh, when it comes to Oakland. And when, you, when we talk about these big spreads, yeah, I mean, I got 12 and a half, it's not 13. It's not an egregious number. Like, we're not we're like, how are you going to see like these minus 26 and a half with UConn against Stenson? But I, I just think Kentucky, it's just presenting them an opportunity to kind of mask their defense in this one, especially if the old Kentucky shows up where defense was optional. Uh, and their offense alone can carry them to this, uh, to, a, to a cover here. All right. So looking at the market now, I think this was 12 when you bet it, put it in the outline. It is 13 and a half now across the industry and has popped to uh, to 14 at Caesars, which out of the uh, you know larger domestic books, I think is on the sharper side. So, you know, might continue to move in that direction. Where is the cutoff line for you uh, on Kentucky with this bet? I'd say 14. 14. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's because I don't really remember about North Carolina. It's just the defense, you know, it's just so oh, he's going to let that backdoor opportunity if that defense doesn't show up. But yeah, 12 and a half, I thought that was egregiously small um, because this team, offense alone, especially against Oakland, because I mean, the zone, the a zone's easy to be bust if you have shot makers. And one thing I absolutely love about Kentucky now, granted, the four teams kind of out of foul trouble range. Um, Kentucky, uh, one thing that I absolutely love that I haven't mentioned yet phenomenal free throw shooting and to me that is absolutely massive for end of game covering i mean <laughs> we're talking reed shepherd um <laughs> we're talking about multiple 90 percent free throws it's 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 awesome I absolutely that's the, that's the kind of identity especially that i love that, that shuts that backdoor uh, opportunity but yeah this offense alone i think can carry him to a cover all right so cody this was a lot of fun you are going to be providing a pretty regular stream of content uh for betting life here throughout march madness uh you know pieces for the first four i think multiple pieces for the uh the early rounds of the tournament uh you know early games later games so a ton of content that people should check out of yours at fantasy life uh it's good to have you on the show and to uh to cut it up with you and to get some uh get some of your march madness wisdom yeah, uh, thank you for having me. Uh, in terms of uh, content-wise, it's looking like we'll have one first four piece, and I believe I'll be doing a, I guess we'll call it a daytime best bets, nighttime best bets per each day. Um, super excited to break down these games in more depth. And yeah, the best time of the year has arrived. I uh, can't wipe the smile off my face. Super excited to get this tournament started. All right, great to have you on the show. That is going to do it for this episode of The Betting Life Show brought to you by Fantasy Life. Please subscribe to the show and the newsletter. Tell your degenerate betting friends. Join the Discord, see all of our bets in the free Fantasy Life Bet Tracker and follow us on social media at K Malstrom and Matt F. The Oracle. Thank you and see you again next episode.